First of all, Stephen Kinnock. Uh, good afternoon, Chancellor. Um, I wanted to turn to paragraph 49 of the Joint Progress Report, as you'll know, of course, confirmed that all parties to the negotiation um, agreed that full regulatory alignment would be the fallback position for dealing with the issue of the Northern Ireland um, border. And, and then we've seen the ensuing draft legal text that's been produced by the Commission, which really just codifies what was agreed in the Joint Progress Report. But that legal text has been met by much huffing and puffing from the Prime Minister and other members of the government. C can you explain why it is that what is apparently just a conversion into legalese of what was agreed in December has created such an adverse reaction? Well, I, I don't think it does just convert into legal text um, uh, what is contained in paragraph uh, 49. Um, paragraph 49 does indeed say that the United Kingdom will maintain full alignment with those rules of the internal market and the customs union, which now or in the future support north-south cooperation, the all-island economy and the protection of the 1998 agreement. Um, we, do, uh, we do not agree with the approach that the Commission has taken in um, uh, seeking to further uh, define that commitment in a way that crosses a red line that um, I believe would be the red line of any uh, UK Prime Minister, any uh, UK government, because uh, it seeks to present the fallback option uh, in a way that would undermine the constitutional settlement that exists in the United Kingdom. But isn't the legal text simply saying that um, full regulatory alignment between the European and the UK, European Union and the UK post Brexit uh, will mean just that? It will mean um, pro common product standards, the the basis of what we have now as a customs union. I mean, I I isn't it simply? Can you just help? The no, it doesn't. To understand I mean, it, what, it, what is the fun, what is the, the problem? It, What's the it difference doesn't. between because the two? As, as I've understood the uh, Commission's legal text, it doesn't say that. It says that uh, this commitment in Article 49 would be delivered in a specific way, and that is a way which would create a border down the Irish Sea, which is something that we have said from the outset would be unacceptable, and I believe would be unacceptable to the overwhelming majority of members of Parliament. Thank you. Um, some time ago, two weeks ago, I think, uh, um, the Brexit Minister Robin Walker said that uh, the fallback option on resolving the Irish border issue uh, doesn't actually mean full alignment, but rather would mean outcomes-based rather than necessarily based on rule-taking. How is it possible to have an outcome if you don't have agreement on the input? Uh, I mean, I think as you, you said just now in an answer to, to my colleague, um, you, we get out of the bottom what we put into the top. So if we're going to have um, th this outcome, surely we have to have full regulatory al alignment as the input. Uh, no, I think that it is um, uh, quite possible to envisage situations where there is more than one way to deliver uh, the same outcome. Um, and the, in some areas, it may be, in some uh, cases, it may be that alignment of um, regulatory method is considered important. But in many areas, we believe that uh, achieving a similar outcome is what is really required to create the level playing field for an, for an open market and f uh, free and fair trade bit across international borders. But, Chancellor, I mean, you, you're, you have a background in business yourself. I mean, don't you think there's a risk here that we're getting into this sort of Kafka-esque mess of aligning with some things and not with others, a kind of hodgepodge of three baskets and uh, outcomes not being the same as inputs? and. For the, biz for the British business community, isn't this just looking like a, a bureaucratic nightmare? No, I think you could make it sound a lot more complex than it is. And I think the key uh, thing to remember is that we will be starting from uh, a situation of de facto alignment in every sense. Outcomes, inputs, rules, regulations will be aligned on day one. 
So the only question of any misalignment arising is where we, Parliament, has deliberately decided to take action to create uh, a divergence. Um, and as the Prime Minister said on Friday, if Parliament, depending on the details of uh, the agreement we reach with the European Union, um, if Parliament makes such a decision, it would do so uh, in the full knowledge and understanding of what the consequences of such a decision uh, would be. And it would be for us, collectively, to have a debate about the benefits uh, and the disbenefits of any such course of action. I think what is important here for many people is the principle that Parliament will be the sovereign decision maker. Parliament will decide. Parliament is perfectly capable uh, of weighing up the costs uh, and benefits in any given uh, situation and deciding whether to act to create divergence or whether not to. The important thing is that Parliament has the power to do that should it choose. So well, in each, it, I'm sorry, Chair. Yes, uh, yes, go I ahead. I just want to move on to. Sorry, well, yes. I've, got, I've got five people who want to ask. Fully understand. On sorry, Chair. Yeah. No, at all. No, I'm done. Um, first you. of all, I know. I think uh, maybe there's room for Stephen Kennett just at the end. Go right. So I don't think you don't. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just, just, Chancellor, just to go back to this issue of, of simplicity and the need for business to have certainty and simplicity in terms of the, the basic rules of the game. Um, and I think most business people will say, look, we, we can adapt, but we need to know what the rules of the game are. And, and with this hybrid approach that the Prime Minister set out on Friday, she's in essence trying to invent something new. Don't you think it would just be far simpler to commit the United Kingdom to going into EFTA and the European Economic Area? Well understood, well established, EFTA since the 1960s, EEA since 1993. Our business community would understand what it's all about, how it works. Uh, and in fact, there are many opportunities to influence and shape uh, EU legislation as, as Norway has shown uh, many times in the past. So w why do you think it is that complexity is being chosen over simplicity? Uh, because we're in, we're in a complex situation because membership of EFTA, as I suspect you very well know, um, would involve accepting the full freedom of movement provisions uh, between European Union and uh, an EFTA uh, country. And um, that is something that we have ruled out as part of our interpretation of the decision of the British people in the referendum of June uh, 2016. The Prime Minister has been very clear that freedom of movement as we have it now cannot continue after we leave the European Union. But Articles 112 and 113 of the EEA agreement allow for an emergency break and safeguard clauses on all of the four freedoms. They allow for short-term uh, provi emergency provisions in very specific circumstances, um, but I think I'm right in saying that those uh, provisions have never been used. Norway contemplated them on one occasion, uh, at, or maybe two occasions, and uh, when they looked at what the potential consequences might have been, resiled from actually I think that's right, isn't it? I think there may be examples of Liechtenstein using them. Liechtenstein. Very, 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 well, I, I would Lichtenstein. hazard to suggest is to the example, committee that... Shall we pass on from that? Liechtenstein may not be exactly equivalent to the, the UK. UK. I'll write to you, Chancellor. Uh, you can, Stephen, I'll write to you. You can ask this question again tomorrow if you want to. Thank you. I, think I will, we'll don't worry. The Chancellor <laughs> on that. But we, I've got one or two other questions to come. We've got five minutes to go 